Hi, good evening. Uh, it's really great to be here. Thank you for coming out. This is uh, my second time uh, coming to Town Hall, and I was very excited uh, when this was put on the calendar for uh, the book tour. Uh, so I feel very glad to be back here. Um, I'm a native Oregonian. I'm from Portland, so I feel like I'm sort of coming a little bit of a homecoming here uh, as well. So thank you for coming out and spending some time uh, to hear me talk about a story that I, I hope won't give you nightmares, uh, but maybe will give you some... Uh, uh, food for thought, and uh, we can have a, hopefully a good discussion afterwards. Um, this book, uh, it, which if you haven't seen it, here it is, by the way, a very clever at war title. Um, it, it really it tries to tell the story of how cybersecurity became a top national security priority for the United States. Um, many of you have probably been following the debate about surveillance after the disclosures of Edward Snowden uh, from 2013. I read a lot about this in my, my first book, which came out in 2010. Um, but it's safe to say that there's also been an entire debate and a lot of energy and focus around this whole question of securing and protecting the internet. And not just people's personal information, but the, the physical systems that are connected to the internet, the critical infrastructures like the power grid, uh, water treatment facilities, banking systems that are increasingly run on this interconnected network of computers, um, which have been uh, vulnerable for quite some time, and there's a lot of attention around that vulnerability now. And it's something that has been really animating the discussion in national security in Washington. In fact, just today, uh, as, as if on cue for this talk, uh, the director of the National Security Agency, Admiral Mike Rogers, who is also the commander of something called U.S. Cyber Command, which is sort of the part of the military where all of our cyber defense and warfare activities are located. He gave testimony today before the House Intelligence Committee in which he disclosed that a number of foreign governments, plural, have probed and penetrated the computer systems that run portions of the electrical grid in the United States and presumably are doing that in case they should ever want to try to turn the lights off in large portions of the United States. Pretty extraordinary admission um, from the NSA director. Uh, not something that we haven't heard before, but something that you rarely hear in the, uh, the venue uh, of a congressional hearing. <clears throat> now, just to give you a little flavor of this, what he said today, because it was really quite extraordinary, um, he said, this is not theoretical, referring to the possibility that someone could remotely disable a portion of the electrical grid. So the U.S. networks are, the, the hacking attacks on U.S. networks are his words, literally costing us hundreds of billions of dollars. This is from the information that's frequently stolen and the cost of securing these networks. He called it, it would be said that there would be a truly significant, almost catastrophic failure if we don't take action. And he actually said that he believes that in his time in office, he will have to be responding to a major attack on a portion of our cyber networks, uh, analogous to a terrorist attack that we've seen, um, which we haven't seen the likes of since 9-11. So Rogers is really echoing sort of a, a big conversation that's happening in Washington right now. The past two years, the intelligence agencies collectively put out a report every year on global threats. Uh, cyber threats to our networks and also the threat of cyber espionage directed at our corporations, stealing secrets from companies, has ranked at the top of that list of global threats from the spy agencies for the past two years. James Comey, who's the new director of the FBI, has said that the risk of cyber attacks and a rise in cyber-related crime, such as credit card theft and identity theft, uh, will be the most significant national security threat over the next decade, more than terrorism. This coming from an FBI that has been almost singularly devoted to counterterrorism since the 9-11 attacks. So there's been a major shift in the conversation and in the priorities in the national security community. And, and this book really tells the story of how we got there. Um, so it opens with uh, w a fairly scary story, which I think is always a nice way to open a tale like this, um, which I'll, I'll relate to you now. Uh, in the summer of 2007, uh, the CEOs of the major defense contractors in the United States, companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, which I understand is kindly a sponsor of this event, <laughs> unintentional, I assure you, <laughs> uh, they may not like what I'm about to say, um, were summoned to a meeting at the Pentagon in Washington. Um, they didn't exactly know why they were brought there, but when the CEOs of all these companies are looking around, seeing each other gathered together in one room, they can probably surmise it's not good news. 
uh, they were ushered in uh, to a room called a SCIF, a secu uh, Sensitive Compartmentalized Information Facility. If you watch Homeland or any spy movies, the SCIF is the thing that they have to take your cell phone out first and they do the little retinal scan and you go in this room that sort of looks like a soundproof box. It's impervious to eavesdropping and surveillance. It's a room that you go into when you're about to hear something very classified and very highly sensitive, which is what these guys heard. Um, they were given a threat briefing by military officials and senior Pentagon officials about cyber spies located presumably in China, people who were penetrating the networks of computers inside the United States and making off with large amounts of information about classified weapon systems, and particularly one called the Joint Strike Fighter, or the F-35. And the F-35 is sort of our next generation fighter jet, the fighter to end all fighters. It's gonna be used by all of the military services. It's the most expensive single weapon system ever produced in the United States. And somehow these spies were making off with tons of information about its avionics, its defensive systems, its weapons. Um, but the catch here was that these spies had not penetrated the systems of the military. They would not broken into computer databases in the Pentagon, which were actually well secured. They'd broken into the computers of these companies represented by these CEOs, the companies who were actually working on this project and other sensitive classified programs for the military. These spies had essentially made an end run. And instead of trying to attack their target head on, had gone around the back and hit the contractors who work for the government and had all of this sensitive information on their computers, which these CEOs now discovered were not very well secured. Um, as it was described to me by somebody who's familiar with this meeting, a lot of people went into this meeting with dark hair and when they came out, it was white. They were really, really scared by what they had learned and by um, to find out that this was all happening under their noses and they knew very little about it. So the Pentagon says to them, look, you've got a security problem, which means we have a security problem. And we're gonna have to work together to solve this. And what that's going to look like is that you are going to take information from us that we know about hackers and foreign spies that we've gleaned from espionage. And in return, you are going to tell us the threats that you're seeing on your networks, and you're going to tell each other about that, which is a pretty extraordinary thing to make competitors like this open up to each other about their security. Um, and we're going to work together to try and protect these networks. And the implicit threat here being that if you don't cooperate with us, you may not find yourself receiving billions of dollars in US military contracts in the future. So I like to tell this story because it sort of epitomizes our current national approach to defending this vast domain that we call cyberspace. Uh, companies are essential in this. 85% of the networks, the physical infrastructure that really comprises ultimately the internet in this country, is privately owned. The government doesn't own it, it doesn't regulate it, it's not treated as a utility. These are private networks owned by companies like the ones that were in that room. So if the government wants to protect that cyberspace, it has to work with corporations to do it. Out of that meeting, something developed called the Defense Industrial Base Initiative, or the DIB, as it's called in Washington. Sort of this cone of silence around these companies working hand in glove with government to try and defend cyberspace. It started with a few dozen members and today comprises about 100 companies. And this model has since expanded into other portions uh, of the economy. Um, today, the National Security Agency, which is our biggest intelligence agency that spies on foreign governments and terrorist groups and that you read about in the Snowden Files, um, is actually sharing information about hackers and threats with large internet service providers in this country. Maybe the ones that actually you subscribe to and that carry your email and route your traffic. Telling them, here are the things that we see, go filter your networks to, 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 to prevent uh, hacking incidents and to prevent threats against our critical infrastructure. Um, big technology companies have now partnered up with the NSA and secret arrangements to defend cyberspace. Google, uh, probably being one of the best examples. Several years ago, Google found that its own systems had been penetrated by Chinese hackers. And what's the first thing that it did? One of the first things was it called the National Security Agency and said, we have a problem here. Um, the day after that breach was announced, the agency and Google entered into a still secret partnership whereby Google tells the NSA, these are the kinds of threats that we're seeing on the network, not particular information about customers, mind you, and they're not giving them backdoor access, but essentially saying, here's the bird's eye view that we, as one of the biggest technology companies in the world, are seeing about threats on these networks. And the NSA, in turn, shares information with Google. 
It's a really extraordinary thing. I don't think it's ever been the case in the history of the country where intelligence agencies, spying agencies, are sharing otherwise classified secrets with corporations and asking them to act on that information. So defending cyberspace and really conducting offensive operations in it has actually become now a cooperative effort between government and the intelligence community and its partners in the technology industry. And that's really what I mean by the military internet complex, is this alliance of these two very powerful forces, public and private. And I'm very consciously drawing an analogy to what President Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex uh, in his farewell address to the nation in 1961. There are a lot of similarities between these two very powerful forces. So, this arrangement really took off sort of at the end of the Bush administration. Um, and which was sort of remarkable that it took as long as it did because around about 2007 when the energy really heats up for this, it's not like people in Washington hadn't been warning about threats to our computer networks. Not long after 9-11, there were people in the White House who started in fact telling reporters like me, look, it's not just terrorists we have to worry about, it's foreign hackers. Somebody could have done a lot of damage to a computer network rather than flying a plane into a building. Um, but President Bush was famously not the most technolo technologically inclined president. He once said that he looked at the Google on occasion to look at photos of his ranch in Texas. Um, not to pick on President Bush, President Clinton reportedly only sent one email the entire time that he was in office. <clears throat> the internet was sort of a nascent uh, apparatus at that time. Um, but President Obama is really the, when, when he takes office, is when this sort of national kind of military internet complex idea really starts to come to life. Um, Obama is, is certainly the first president of the internet generation. Um, he used the internet in his campaign to great effect. And he also, when he was on the trail, got some first-hand experience in the nature of this threat. So his own email systems in the campaign were hacked by spies, presumably in China, who were trying to read and find out everything they could about who this man was that might become the next president. Um, not to leave any stone unturned, the hackers also hit John McCain's uh, networks as well. So Obama was told about this during the, the, the election season. He was given threat briefings about this by the FBI. And pretty much on the day that he takes office, he is then told that our computer networks in this country are extremely vulnerable to attacks to penetrations, much like the one that he experienced, that corporations across the country are experiencing this every single day, and that our critical infrastructure as well has been left woefully unprotected. Um, it does not take him very long to make this a big focus uh, of his first term and of his national security strategy. So in May 2009, this is only four, months after, four or five months after he's taken office, Obama uh, gives this huge speech uh, in the East Room of the White House. And presidents, when they do a speech in the East Room, which is something probably about twice the size of this room, it's for a really big deal event and a really momentous occasion. Uh, and I was at this and the room was really packed. And he does something extraordinary. He gets up, he confesses to the fact that his own email systems have been hit. He talks openly about the fact that spies are stealing information from under the nose of our corporations. And he actually says that we know of a foreign organization, he won't say which country or who, that has penetrated the, electric, the systems that run the electrical grid in the United States. So here's the President of the United States standing in front of everyone saying, we're vulnerable, it could happen any day. A massive attack on our infrastructure could be devastating, it could be right around the corner. Um, heretofore, most senior officials in government would not even speak on the record about threats like this. And now you had the President of the United States getting up and saying, we are living in an era of these threats. Um, Notably, he said, and I quote from the speech here, the vast majority of our critical information infrastructure in the United States is owned and operated by the private sector. We will collaborate with industry to find technology solutions that ensure our security and promote prosperity. He is really outlining the crux of the military internet complex in that speech. And then he goes on to describe the internet as, quote, a strategic national asset which we will protect as such. So, Momentous occasion, but also a conflict there. Talking about the need to join in a cooperative effort to control and protect these privately owned net networks, but it's also a strategic national asset. I mean, he's speaking of it the way we talk about our airspace, the way we talk about protecting our borders, really elevating this to, uh, to um, uh, a level of homeland defense that is usually the domain of the military. <clears throat> He is describing cyberspace effectively as a battlefield. 
um, which is exactly how the military now talks about it and sees it, and how the intelligence agencies view it as well. And that is really where the center of gravity is in our national approach to securing cyberspace. They have been put in the lead, these agencies, because they have the most information about who is trying to penetrate the networks. The military now calls cyberspace the fifth domain of warfare after land, air, sea, and outer space. And it views trying to achieve supremacy in that, supremacy in that domain as essential as it is in the other four. It is the only domain, however, in which no one can claim that they actually rule it. No country could probably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us in a conventional military setting, but there are lots of countries right now trying to achieve dominance in cyberspace, and we're not the only ones. Um, to give you a sense of how kind of fixated the military and the intelligence community has become on achieving dominance in cyberspace, you can follow the money, which is always a great way to figure out what's important in Washington and where the priorities have been put. So a little picture of this is a little snapshot. Uh, in 2014, for the 2014 budget, the U.S. government plans to spend more than $13 billion on cyber defense programs. This is just the defensive portion, right? This doesn't really account for the offensive side, which is all classified and held in the intelligence budget. So $13 billion, mostly just to protect government computers and networks and to share information with private industry through these alliances. Put that in pers from perspective, that $13 billion figure, in 2014, the government plans to spend $11.6 billion on direct efforts to combat climate change which Obama has called in his speech the global threat of our time. So in just one portion of the unclassified budget, we're spending $13 billion on cyber defense, $11.6 billion on climate change. It's a pretty, pretty stark um, uh, contrast, I think. There, You would think that we'd be spending perhaps a lot more on climate change if that is perceived as the, the threat of our time, as the president has called it. The 2012 Pentagon budget, two years ago, had the word cyber in it only 12 times. The 2014 Pentagon budget has the word cyber in it 147 times. It's kind of become a joke in Washington now that if you want to get money for a new military program, you should just mention the word cyber and they'll throw money at it. Uh, it's the only portion of the defense budget that's actually growing. We hear all the time about how military budgets are being slashed, sequestration is taking this toll, not in cyberspace, not when it comes to cyber defense and offense. In fact, the, the, the senior uh, official in charge of cybersecurity for the Pentagon recently gave a speech in which he said it's become sort of ludicrous that he's seeing all of these budget requests come across his desk with the word cyber slapped on things that have nothing to do with cyberspace. And he joked that if you want to get money for your new battle system in Washington, just say you're funding money for the cyber tank, you know, and somebody or the cyber airplane, and somebody will, will fund it. Um, there's a lot of incentive right now in Washington to talk up the, the threats uh, as, as I've illuminated or uh, sort of described them now. And it's not to say that they're not real threats, but you're hearing more and more officials talk about this openly. And I think a big part of that reason is that they want to drum up funding for it uh, and attention, and they don't want to be called out for having underestimated or downplayed the risk of a cyber attack on the United States. But they're not telling the whole story. For all of the things that we describe, China or accuse China or Russia or even the Iranians and other countries of doing to us, we are doing to other countries. Anything that someone is doing to us, we can do to them and we are doing it to them. We do break into the computer systems of foreign corporations and steal their information. We do try to probe the electrical grids of foreign countries. We do all these things. It's one of the reasons why we know how dangerous it could be if anyone ever did it to us because we know how much we could screw with them. Um, there's a story I tell in the book in the first couple of chapters that I think really kind of captures how sophisticated we've become at this offensive side of cyber, which officials really don't like to talk about. Um, and that I think illustrates how good the US has become at waging cyber war and where these, what these wars are gonna look like in the future. Um, in 2007, you'll all recall the, the troop surge in Iraq, where President Bush ordered tens of thousands of more ground forces to deploy to Iraq to quell a growing insurgency uh, by terrorist forces and also the group Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which later morphed into ISIS, which we're fighting today in Iraq and Syria. Um, the violence was spinning out of control. The country was on the verge of a, a total civil war and a sectarian kind of implosion. And we sent these tens of thousands of more combat forces to, to to get control of the situation. Well, another pillar of that strategy, which has really not been discussed much, was a cyber warfare component. The National Security Agency 
tapped into the networks of Iraq, the telecommunications and internet systems, and literally owned the network of that country. They were able to intercept and collect every email, every text message, every phone call that was sent in Iraq. Now, why were they doing this? They wanted to use the communications and the networks and the, the cyber systems, if you like, of these insurgent fighters to get inside their network, understand them, and ultimately break them. Uh, I write about a guy in the book who was part of this effort. His name is Bob Stasio. He was a 20-something young army lieutenant uh, who joined up and, and deployed to Iraq. Um, he was a big fan of the HBO show The Wire. Does anybody out here watch The Wire? Okay. So you remember in The Wire, there's this great detective. He's sort of the old veteran detective named Lester Freeman. And Lester, rather than going out and walking the beat and trying to gather intelligence from a network of people uh, and informants to figure out who the kingpins are in the drug network in Baltimore, he starts studying their phone records. He starts trying to piece together who is calling who, who are the important guys, who are the big fish in the network. And by looking at this data, actually builds a network of understanding the hierarchy of, 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 the, of, the, of the criminal rings and who are the most important people that they need to go after. Well, Bob Stasio and his fellows in the, uh, the military and in the NSA did exactly that with the insurgency in Iraq. They monitored their communications to understand who these people were, how they were moving, where they were planting roadside bombs, who was making the suicide bombs, who were their couriers, and importantly, where were these people located. Um, your phone can actually be a pretty sensitive and accurate homing device to give away your location. The NSA used those phones in many cases to physically locate where these people were and then to either go capture them or kill them. Uh, they did some other really ingenious things. They sent fake text messages to members of these insurgent networks posing as people they knew and trusted, saying effectively, meet us on this corner to go plan the operation at this time. And when they got there, they fell into a trap. U.S. forces were waiting for them. The NSA found ways to implant spyware in websites that were frequented and chat rooms that were frequented by um, jihadis and other members of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, they go there thinking that they're communicating with people uh, about the fight and about the operations they're planning and secretly the NSA is remotely installing information on their computers so that they can read their emails. They were actually able to break into the email folders of some of these guys and read messages that they were saving uh, and the draft folders that they were uh, then leaving there for other guys to come pick up really ingenious ways of figuring out how they were communicating and trying to evade surveillance. The NSA gets inside those networks and effectively sees exactly what these guys are talking about and goes out and cap and sends the information to ground forces who then go out and capture or kill them. Um, this intelligence cycle, this cyber warfare kind of cycle of the spies, the digital spies, and the ground forces working together is, I think, the reason why the United States achieved a victory during the surge in Iraq. A temporary victory, to be sure. But we quelled the violence and essentially brought some stability back to the country. And really that operation has never been credited, uh, I think, for the fundamental role that it played in the surge. Um, David Petraeus, who was the commander of all ground forces in Iraq, has actually said publicly that this combination of cyber with ground forces is, quote, a prime reason for the significant progress made by U.S. troops during the surge of 2007 and 2008 and his words, quote, directly enabled the removal of almost 4,000 insurgents from the battlefield. That's an extraordinary achievement. Um, Iraq changed the way that the NSA and the intelligence agencies spy and the way the United States will fight wars in the future. Cyber operations are going to become an indispensable part of conventional military operations. Iraq is where this, really, this model was born. Um, in this zeal to dominate cyberspace as the fifth domain of warfare, uh, I argue in the book that the government, in partnership with the corporations with which it's formed these alliances, may be making great gains to control that space and do amazing things from a military perspective, perspective but that it's fundamentally actually making all of us more vulnerable to the very kinds of attacks that we are trying to stop. Um, the NSA is a great example of this. The NSA is a, is a big, big intelligence agency, about 40,000 people, untold billions that it spends every year, has two very conflicting missions. On the one hand, it wants to protect computer networks in the United States, it wants to keep the bad guys out. 
On the other hand, it wants to go and break into computer networks <laughs> in the United States and outside the United States and find out what it can about those bad guys. Well, these networks are all comprised of commercial technology. They're, you know, it's, it's Microsoft, it's Cisco, it's AT&T. These are things that are used all over the world. Well, the NSA goes to great lengths to try to figure out how to weaken those systems so that it can get into them. But when you weaken those systems and the security that's in place, these systems, these technologies we're all using, you're putting all of us at risk too. Um, a couple of good examples of this that I write about in the book. Um, some of you may be familiar with something called encryption. Uh, encryption is basically just a way of uh, turning your communication, maybe your email that you send to your friend, uh, into a jumble that only the two of you can decode when you have the key to unlock it. Encryption is used in internet communications, it's used to protect your financial transactions, it's a pretty fundamental and very good way of, of preserving privacy and security on the internet. Well, the NSA, a number of years ago, got involved in helping to write an encryption algorithm that was later promoted publicly, which makes a lot of sense. The NSA is actually a cryptographic agency. It knows a lot about making codes and breaking codes, um, and actually played a role in uh, encouraging people to adopt this particular uh, form of encryption that was then put out by a uh, big technology company and sold and used uh, all over the world. Well, what the NSA didn't tell people was that it was inserting a secret flaw into the encryption that it thought only it knew about. So that if it ever needed to unencrypt the information that was being used, uh, it would have the secret key to do that. Well, the problem with this is, is that the NSA is, are, are not the only smart hackers in the world. You insert a flaw like that, someone else might find it too. And you've gone out and told everyone to use this product but not told them that there's a back door in it. Um, I use the analogy of imagine that the government came out and said, uh, we have helped develop this amazing new door lock. Everyone should install it on the front door of your house. It will keep all the bad guys out. Your house will be basically, you know, burglar proof. Except the government has a secret key to it, and the key is not particularly well hidden. Someone else could find it too. Um, we would be outraged <laughs> if the government were around to be doing that. And I argue that NSA was essentially doing that too and putting us all at risk. Um, another way that, that, that they've undermined security, which they seem to be wanting to promote, paradoxically, uh, is in collecting information about flaws in commercial software and computer operating systems. So there's something called a zero day. Uh, a zero day is a flaw in a system that has never been discovered before, kind of a way into the system that allows you to penetrate via some flaw in the programming and potentially take control of a computer. Uh, this is a flaw of a zero day that's never been discovered except for the person who just found it. So if you are Microsoft and I find a zero day in your operating system, you Microsoft don't know about it, but I know where that hole is and I can exploit it. Well, this is really valuable information if you are in the business of trying to break into computers. So if you're a hacker, a criminal hacker, you look for these zero day flaws. And in fact, there is a fairly thriving black market online for this kind of information. Uh, hackers are out there researching systems all the time and selling this zero day information to the highest bidder. Well, in the United States, the single largest purchaser of these zero day flaws is the National Security Agency largely through a network of defense contractors, uh, goes out and acquires this information and keeps it secret, keeps it known only to itself, largely so that it can build exploits to go penetrate those vulnerabilities, to build weapons if necessary to take advantage of that. So makes some sense if your job is to go out and break into computer systems, you want to know how to do that. But again, your agency is supposed to be in the business of defending all of us. Shouldn't you be telling us when you find these flaws? Shouldn't they be alerting Microsoft? when they find a flaw in that system. Um, this is something that actually got revealed by the Snowden documents. We know a lot about this thing, uh, uh, thanks to those in part. Um, I argue that this is something that the NSA is also doing that is fundamentally putting us more at risk. If you're really in the business of defending the United States and defending our strategic national asset, shouldn't you be in the business of telling people when you find the ways that the bad guys can get in? Um, these approaches to cybersecurity that the government is taking, you know, they may allow us to strike at our enemies more effectively, but it's leaving the vast majority of internet users, and not just in this country really, but in the world, exposed to the very kinds of attacks that we seem to want to prevent. And all of this has really happened with practically no debate. Uh, you know, we, we've talked some about surveillance authorities and spying on Americans and collecting phone call information. Um, post Snowden mainly, but really we haven't given much thought to how it is that we are approaching this 
problem of cybersecurity that is inarguably important. I mean, I'm not saying that we should, you know, discount threats in cyberspace, but why haven't we really had a debate about this? Why has this whole vast apparatus stood up largely in secret? Um, and I'm hoping in some ways that the book can kind of help be a corrective to that. I think it's time that we start having a much more open conversation about what our own officials are telling us is the most important national security priority of the day. We should be talking much more openly about it than we are. This conjunction of a huge war fighting machine with a growing technology industry uh, is unprecedented, I think, in our history. Um, I hearken back to President Eisenhower's 61 speech for a reason, and I write about this in the end of the book. He said that the military industrial complex of a previous generation was, quote, new in the American experience. Um, it's really striking when you think about it. this is a man who had been the supreme allied commander in Europe, had led us through World War II, and then becomes the commander in chief of the armed forces. And in that speech, he's effectively saying, this military has morphed into something that I don't recognize because of this convergence with industry, with this sort of this private profit motivated interest. Um, and I argue that the same kind of thing is happening when it comes to cyberspace and the internet. Um, and that it is changing the way that we all use cyberspace and therefore directly affects our lives. Um, cyberspace, it is just too vast and too pervasive and too important to allow a single entity or a single alliance like this to govern it and dictate the norms of behavior. And I argue that this authority certainly should not be vested in an intelligence agency that operates largely in secret and quite frankly has been shown to be uh, um, taking all kinds of liberties with our personal information that we didn't find out about until years after the fact. There's no neat way to define cyberspace and I don't try to do that in this book. Um, it's not a commons, but it's not private. We've come to depend upon it like a public utility, like our electrical and water systems, but it's still mostly a collective of privately owned devices. That has not changed. But I think cyberspace is undeniably, we can all agree, a collective, uh, which is why I think it's incumbent on everyone who touches it, that's all of us, to take a stake in how we treat it and to find what President Eisenhower, I think, very wisely called, said in his speech was a central agreement on the issues of great moment the wise resolution of which will better shape the future of our nation. Um, I think he had it right. I think if he were alive today, he'd be calling for the exact same type of skepticism and caution and encouraging us to all find some essential agreement on how we're going to control and govern and live in this space. So thank you very much. Um, Enough talking from me. I would love to have a conversation with all of you, uh, answer any questions that you might have about the book, about the subjects that I've discussed, uh, anything that you're hearing about in Washington around this debate, and, and when, what concerns you about the, the subject as well. Yes, please. Uh, during the Cold War, we had something, of course, called mutually assured destruction. So is something similar developing here in cyberspace where if the Chinese wanted to uh, bring down our, our electrical grid, we can do the same to them. I, I don't know quite how that develops, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a great question. And, and, and um, I should say that when, it comes, when you talk about cybersecurity, people are frequently drawing analogies to the Cold War and to the question of um, strategic weapons, nuclear weapons. And the question of mutually assured destruction frequently comes up. And I think that there, there are useful parallels there. So. Um, Take China, for instance. I mean, in China, China is sort of the, the, the becoming like uh, the Soviet Union was in the nuclear age. It's sort of becoming like, you know, the bit of the, uh, of the main enemy. Um, China has no real interest in trying to knock out a major bank in the United States or cause a financial panic through cyber attacks because they're our largest creditor. And anything that they do to sink our economy or disrupt our way of life is going to come back on them, impossibly and twofold. <coughs> um, the Russians, notwithstanding Putin's sort of you know provocative and um, kind of dumbfounding actions in Ukraine of late, I think know that if they were ever to launch a major attack on a portion of our electrical grid, and we were able to attribute that to them, uh, that we would see that as a military provocation akin to an act of war, and that we would respond. Uh, in fact, the Defense Department has actually been fairly public of late in trying to spell out the kinds of cyber attacks that it would consider to be the equivalent of a conventional attack that would merit a response. And what they've said is that anything on our really critical infrastructure systems, electrical, 
power, utilities, healthcare systems, transportation, would be the kind of thing that if someone were found to have attacked those, they would go to the president and recommend that we respond, not just with cyber force, but with conventional force as well. So I think that to some degree, that is there, that mutually assured destruction deterrence. The problem is, what do you do about rogue actors like Iran or North Korea? What do you do about criminal organizations that might decide that they want to hold hostage a piece of the power grid, um, which has been rumored to happen in at least one country? There you find that people are much more likely to take provocative actions and not worry about the consequences if they think they will never be discovered. Right, so attribution is a big, big problem. Um, no, and attribution simply means knowing where the attack came from. So knowing that it was China that wrecked that system or knowing that it was Russia that took out that part of the grid. Um, if you can't prove who did it, it makes it very difficult to respond. Um, the NSA has gotten a lot better at attribution. Uh, we might be able to narrow down the number of countries who would have an interest in attacking a particular system, um, but that makes it really hard to respond. So the counterweight to sort of mutually assured destruction is that we don't necessarily always know who are the mutual parties in that exchange, and that makes this um, an extraordinarily difficult security challenge. Yes, sir. Uh, the genius of the Pentagon in using this subject to amplify its budget or keep the cuts within reason, takes an awful lot of filtering when you read literally the daily stories that come out. How do you go, you know, you've spent a lifetime at this, how does somebody from the ordinary world, how do you read, how do you read between the lines to figure out what part of this is meant to simply induce fear, <laughs> get us to support bigger budgets or minimize the cuts? And where's the real fear? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and a lot of it is, is a somewhat strategic and cynical calculation on the part of officials in Washington to scare people. I mean, <clears throat> I think you can read it this way. Um, officials genuinely do want to scare you. <laughs> Right, because they want you to take it seriously. Um, <clears throat> you know, 9-11 sort of had a, a formative kind of, it was a formative experience, particularly for the intelligence community. They never want to be in the position again of saying, I'm sorry we didn't warn you. I'm sorry we didn't tell you about, you know, all the bad things hiding under the bed. And now it's sort of, you know, and then the mode of like, we're going to tell you about it, what all these threats might be. Um, I think what you, can, what you can sort of draw kind of a spectrum though to, to know when somebody is maybe exaggerating the threat or harping too much on remote possibilities. So at one end of the spectrum of things that do happen every day, uh, credit card theft, identity theft, um, spies breaking into corporations and stealing trade secrets and giving it back to their, their home countries. Those are things that are real and that are happening every day. Um, as devastating as an attack on the power grid would be, it's a fairly remote possibility, I think. So I think one way to look at this is if you hear officials coming out and talking about things like cybercrime and cyber espionage, you could probably be pretty sure they're on the level and describing a real threat. If all they do is come out and say, the power grid, the power grid, the power grid, they're trying to scare you. It's not to say that there couldn't be a devastating attack on the power grid, but that should not be the thing that we are sort of singularly worried about right now. And it's an, and it's an easy one that kind of gets drawn out each time to sort of the drum up. That said, um, it could happen. It absolutely could happen. And if, and if it did, I think we would all, if we, if we found that our officials hadn't warned us about that, I mean, we would do, heads would roll, right? Or maybe they will actually, in Washington, heads don't really roll anymore. There's not much accountability there. But we would want to know why didn't you tell us and why didn't you warn us sooner? Uh, other questions? Would, yeah. Would you just talk more about your background related to all of this? Sure. Um, so I started writing about technology uh, in government uh, uh, basically around 2001, early 2001. Um, I got hired to write about contractors, actually. Uh, so I was writing for a magazine that covered sort of government as a, you know, government as a business, we actually called it, which was a very interesting conceit. So I was sort of, without knowing it, writing about the military industrial complex, largely through IT companies. Uh, and after the 9-11 attacks, um, those companies kind of rushed into the to, the, to the space and said, we can build uh, computer systems that can collect information, analyze information, do surveillance, help you connect the dots about the next attack and make sure there's not another 9-11. So those tech companies 
uh, which uh, are, are, are actually, calling them tech companies is almost misleading. These were companies like Raytheon and Boeing and Lockheed Martin who have just big technology divisions, um, were the ones who started trying to build up this new intelligence apparatus uh, for the government, which kind of became my entree into writing about national security writ large. And it really wasn't long after 9-11 that you started hearing people warn about this kind of stuff, talking about the vulnerabilities of computer networks. Um, uh, uh, not just to spies, but to terrorist groups and the like. There's a guy named uh, Richard Clark uh, who has written a lot about this. You see him on ABC News a lot. Um, and Dick at the time was one of the, one of the few people on the NSC staff writing about Al-Qaeda and worrying about Al-Qaeda. And cyber kind of became you know, his big thing after 9-11. Um, but it took several years for people in Washington to focus on that. I mean, it, we shouldn't understate the degree to which Al-Qaeda and then the war in Iraq really consumed the attention of, of the national security community. And now there's been space that can kind of accommodate this, this other big worry. Did you see a security No, actually, that's a great question. Uh, not at all. Um, um, <laughs> I was in theater and did sketch comedy when I was in college, uh, which comes in handy in Washington for getting by. Um, <laughs> Uh, I wanted to write. I was just very interested in writing and was always fascinated by government and politics. Um, I was always also just, I loved spy movies. I mean, you know, I loved, I loved, you know, all the Tom Clancy movies. Like, I've seen Hunt for Red October a thousand times. And I kind of grew up being fixated by this stuff and really interested in it. I sort of grew up in the, you know, at the, the height of the Cold War where, you know, literally as like an elementary school kid, I thought, you know, any day we were going to get all, you know, fried in a nuclear war. So I suppose I had some sort of, I thought that was very intriguing. Um, I came to Washington like a lot of young people because I was just interested in, in, in the city uh, and um, just sort of fell into journalism and then realized that that was actually uh, a great way to, to write creatively but about real things and true stories and that's how I got into it. So no tech background whatsoever. You can use encrypt. Yeah, there, I mean, this this phone actually now the iPhone six comes encrypted, such that if you know there's encryption on board. But um, yeah, I use encryption to communicate with certain people in in sensitive ways too. Yeah. So the NSA could not get into it. Oh, they could get into it probably. Yeah, <laughs> if they tried hard enough. You know, what the NSA worries about with 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 really strong encryption is that it could take a very very long time to break it. Um, but you know, they're uh, that's the business they're in is breaking encryption. Right? Yes, sir. Given the role that NSA has in protecting me, I have mixed reactions to the zealousness with which they are pursuing that role. And there's a part of me that goes, they're out there. They're out there for me. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to pick on some places where they've crossed the line that outrages you know, a Boy Scout level sense of ethics. But at the end of the day, I don't care very much about that Boy Scout sense of ethics. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure what, from a prescriptive sense, we as a country should do, independent of our inability of, for the people in this room to cause that to be, but just, you know, what would, what would you want us to be doing in terms of setting rules for NSA. Yeah. Um, I think you, you sort of point to the, the fundamental tension in, in all of this debate around surveillance and post 9-11 that, you know, there, there, there is, it is an agency and there are many agencies that are devoted to protecting us and that want bad things not to happen and at the same time in their pursuit of doing that they you know they can threaten your privacy your liberty uh, your sense of ethics and i think i've tried to illuminate some ways in which the nsa is so working at cross purposes that they might want to think about as the the bureaucratic term would be deconflicting so there there were proposals after the snowden revelations um uh for a number of different reform proposals for the NSA, one of which, and it was radical, was to separate essentially the defensive and the offensive missions. So to take NSA and essentially kind of split it into two organizations where one would be responsible for protecting information and secrets and networks, and the other would be responsible for trying to exploit them. It would have fundamentally changed the DNA of the place. Um, uh, the president did not adopt that. Um, it would have been a radical shift. Uh, I'm not so sure that was a good decision. 
Um, you know, look, the government is full of agencies that are working at cross purposes all the time. I mean, the big United States government, I think, can accommodate that kind of bureaucratic headbutting and that cross purpose. I'm not sure that having this offensive and defensive mission under the control of one person in the form of that director is the right idea. Um, I think that's something that people can look a lot more closely at, is saying, should we be giving some of these other responsibilities to different agencies that don't have, you know, a sort of conflict of interest, really? Um, and it's funny, I mean, you talk to people even in the NSA who work on the defensive side of it, and they will tell you that they're worried about what the offensive guys are doing and vice versa. Um, I think that one thing we could look at, too, and, and ask for, for more debate on is um, how the military should be behaving here. So I argue that um, a lot of this computer offense that's going on should actually not be in the hands of the NSA, or at least under the great influence of the NSA, but should be actually situated in the military. And we're kind of moving in that direction. There's something I alluded to earlier called U.S. Cyber Command, um, which is the military is set up with these things called combatant command. So there's Central Command, which is actually what's running the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's Southern Command. There's uh, Northern Command that does homeland defense. Cyber Command is this new group that's being set up to do cyber operations. Well, NSA effectively is in control of it. This intelligence agency where all of the brain power exists, where all of the equipment is, where all of the expertise is effectively running the show. And in fact, the NSA director actually serves a separate position at the same time as the head of cyber command. So you see how it's sort of like the intelligence agency kind of creeping over the military. You could separate those two. You could have the military take on a much more um, uh, definitive role in that. And why would that be good? It's not that the military is entirely transparent, but generally speaking, the armed forces are more accountable publicly than the intelligence agencies are. They're governed by a different set of the law. They, uh, they are required to report a lot more than the intelligence agencies are. It's a bigger bureaucracy uh, that Congress has managed to exert more oversight authority of. Um, it, it, as weird as it sounds, I guess, I'm actually more comfortable giving these operations over to the military than an intelligence agency. So, I mean, those are some places where there, are, there, there there's real policy debate to be had, and, and I think that, uh, you know, we should all be a part of that. And, you know, talk to your member of Congress or however, you know, you feel that most empowered. Um, I'm not entirely hopeful. Uh, Washington right now can't solve problems. <laughs> and they prefer to punt on them. But I think those are, there's some real ways that we could make this more rational and I think um, I'll be better off. Uh, other questions? Yes. Yeah, what are the chances that these hackers could get into the defense system and launch a nuclear missile? Mm -hmm. um, probably pretty remote insofar as I don't, and don't, quote me on this, but there's, a, there's a great book that Eric Schlosser just wrote about um, the nuclear systems. I'm not sure that those are directly connected via the internet the way that the power grid is. Um, certainly, God, I hope they aren't. Um, uh, so there are, the, the, the military actually does a pretty good job of taking its most sensitive information and systems and physically separating them um, from uh, um, the public internet. So it's called air gapping. So there, there is like a gap of air between the only thing that these air is separating them. They're not touching each other. That's not to say that's foolproof. I actually write in the book about one of these systems um, that um, was being used by Central Command uh, and a virus showed up on it, which was very strange because how did it get there? These were not computers that were connected to the internet. And the theory is that it was probably on um, a thumb drive, a USB, um, that maybe was left somewhere and someone picked it up and then when he went to work one day in Iraq or Afghanistan, plugged it into a computer and bam, it's there. Um, so there are, there are ways into a system. The Stuxnet virus that attacked the Iranian uh, nuclear facilities that we built with the Israelis, that was an air gap system. Precisely how it got in there, we're not entirely sure. Probably we had someone either wittingly or unwittingly uh, act as a courier and get it in. Um, so I guess if you were gaming that out, if you could get access to the facility, even if it wasn't connected, sure. Um, but uh, actually launching a weapon, I don't, I don't know. Now, a weapon system like, you know, the Joint Strike Fighter, which I alluded to earlier, which is, you know, a networked machine, there might be many points of vulnerability into something like that. Yeah. Yes? It sounds like they could never prosecute anyone working for the NSA or, any, or, the, or anything. It sounds like they're kind of immune to any crimes that they commit. Is that pretty much accurate? Well, <clears throat> no, I don't think they're immune to, 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 to prosecution for crimes. I mean, what we have to remember is that, you know, 
all of what I'm describing and what they're doing is actually legal. I mean, the law allows for this. I mean, they are, they're governed by the NSA's operations to the extent that they are largely foreign and aimed at foreign targets. Um, this, this stuff is legal, I mean, what, the, what they're doing. Now, whether or not a company would ever try to sue the NSA and say, hang on a second, uh, you are inserting flaws into my product. Uh, you know, I think a really novel lawsuit would actually be if somebody were to try and say, you are tampering with my intellectual property uh, and, and, and altering it in key ways that materially affect my business, so I'm going to launch a civil lawsuit against you. Um, I'm not sure how many of these companies, particularly the ones that are in this military internet complex, would really want to try and challenge the NSA and piss them off. But, um, but you know, I don't think that, they're, no, they're not immune. I think what they are is insulated. Uh, and for, to a large degree, that's because we just simply don't know about a lot of what they're doing. Um, now, there's a real question about some of the things that Snowden revealed of whether they are, uh, if not illegal, whether they might need to be. Uh, so, I mean, for instance, the collection of Americans' phone records was probably the most controversial program that, that Snowden exposed. The Supreme Court has indicated that it wants to hear a case that would ask the question of whether things like phone records should be subjected to the Fourth Amendment, and therefore the government should have to have a warrant to access them. Currently, they're not. You don't have to have a warrant. The government can have a subpoena, which is a lower threshold. So I think that you're going to see some reconsideration of the legal standards and maybe a redrawing of the lines, um, but not that much. I mean, you know, there was a surveillance bill that was winding its way through Congress this week that would have put some restraints on uh, NSA surveillance. That would have potentially had an implications for their cyber programs as well, um, and it failed to muster the 60 votes to get to a vote uh, in the Senate. So there's not really going to be a lot of legal change going on. Yeah, I know, like, they showed where, like, Clapper had committed perjury or whatever, but they won't. I mean, so... Well, I mean, so Jim Clapper gave testimony in which he, he was asked the question of whether or not the NSA collects mass amounts of data on Americans, and he said no, which is not true. And he later explained that he was trying to give, what was it, the most truthful, untruthful answer? Uh, so he got himself into a little bit of a pickle there uh, as well. But, but yeah, I mean, but you, to, to your point, there are people who, who argued that um, Jim Clapper, the director of national intelligence, um, gave false testimony before Congress. Uh, and so and that was a, a serious accusation. And, um, you know, I think there are people who still feel that he did. And I think he lost a lot of credibility, particularly in the eyes of Congress, for that. Yeah. We have time for one more? Or? Uh, yeah. if, there's, if there's one more. If not, then I will... Uh, yeah? Okay, one more, and then we'll conclude. I would argue that the uh, greatest threat to the military-industrial complex is the people of the United States. And, you know, when I hear you talking about uh, what the United States did in Iraq, mm -hmm. you know, by collecting everybody's records and uh, getting everybody's number, well, they're doing that to us. So um, does it scare you? <laughs> that they might use this on people if things uh, got out of hand and democracy started to raise its ugly head in this country? And is there a way out? <laughs> yeah, it, it, does, it does worry me. I mean, the first book I wrote, um, The Watchers, was largely about this question of, okay, so we've built this capability to collect all of this information, um, and it's a kind of a foregone conclusion that the government's going to collect large amounts of information about us and about people overseas, so what should the constraints be? Um, <clears throat> These are concerns, I should say, that are shared by a lot of people in the intelligence community as well, uh, including whistleblowers, frankly, who've come forward, and not just whistleblowers, but others too, who remember a time not so long ago uh, in the 60s and 70s when our, the FBI and our intelligence agencies were spying on war protesters and monitoring and blackmailing Martin Luther King and spying on Supreme Court justices and doing these just absurd, you know, horrible things, uh, running roughshod over people's civil liberties. Um, the generation in the intelligence community that came after that was reared and schooled with this idea that you do not spy on Americans. We don't collect Americans' communications. We don't monitor people's political speech. We don't look at the things that people are doing that is the activities that are covered by the First Amendment. These were stark lines that were drawn, and for decades they stayed in place. 9-11 blurred those lines. We all know that story now. Uh, and I think that what we're facing today is a situation where we have to be constantly, constantly checking the rules that are in place for how this data gets used. The fact that it's going to be collected, that is, that is a foregone conclusion. We are past that at this point. 
we should be constantly looking for, and this is a lot harder because it requires more inspection, where we draw the lines on how that information is used and what the authorities are uh, when it comes to using our personal information. Um, I hope that people in the intelligence community are still as concerned about that as they were a generation before. Um, but you know, every step that we sort of take after 9-11 that gets more into that old territory, it starts to feel more comfortable and familiar. Uh, and I feel that we're sort of in a, in a, in a squishy middle ground right now. Uh, and, I, and I worry a lot about that, and um, that's why I keep writing on the subject. So thank you very much for coming out. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. I love it when uh, you know, Obama's just about to have a meeting with uh, the president of uh, Brazil, and then comes the revelation that he's been listening to her cell phone conversations, you know, uh, you know the day before she's about to leave. So. Uh, Glenn Greenwald said that he was going to get him back for uh, taking his boyfriend hostage, and uh, I think that might have been retribution. I don't know, but maybe the timing was coincidental. You know. government had a secret operation, massacring villages, killing millions, secretly bombing an entire nation. They wiretapped a hotel room, got caught, and the government was deposed because of secret documents Daniel Ellsberg exposed. One government came down to prevent a repetition of this fact. The next government passed the Freedom of Information Act. Each administration since then hoped it would go away, and then they finally seized the chance on a September day. They passed the Patriot Act before a single congressman had read it. But don't ask the executive how they interpret it, because that itself is secret, never to be revealed, just like their secret prisons and all the torture sessions they reconceal. Then they formed the prison program so they wouldn't even have to ask compliant corporations to assist them in the task of collecting information. Every email you ever wrote, every book you ever read, every call you ever made, everything you ever said. I looked into a prism. What did I see? A police state looking back at me. The secret government men lied to congressional committees. Secret information even a senator can't see. Secret bureaucrats working with secret corporations, enforcing secret laws, forming secret juries to serve a secret cause. I looked into a prism. What did I see? A police state looking back at me. One brave man came forward and then he fled town. And now the secret government men mean to hunt him down. Feinstein says he's a traitor, McConnell said so too. But I'd say if we have a future, it's because of the whistle that he blew. I looked into a prism, what did I see? A police state looking back at me. I looked into a prism, what did I see? A police state looking back at me.